All right. So hello and welcome to the officially official start. This was the Swing Smarter monthly newsletter, but now it is the Swing Smarter Hitting Training Podcast. I am your host, Joey Myers from HittingPerformanceLab.com and, and a guest with me who has been a follower of mine for quite a long time. And we've corresponded quite frequently over email and have done some phone calls is Joe Yurko. So first, I want to welcome you to the show, Joe. Thank you. I uh, appreciate you having me. It's, uh, it's indeed an honor. <laughs> well, I think you have a, a lot of cool stuff to talk about. And in, and in today's episode, we're going to be going into the sports psychology part of hitting. And before we get there, and I think this is uh, what Joe has to say, I will also, by the way, put two links to a couple articles that Joe has written on, on a pretty cool website that I recommend a lot of you go check out. I will put those in the, the transcription notes or the show notes for those that, that want to click on that and, and, and read some more. I, I read both of them and we'll be talking about uh, a lot of that info here. But first, Joe, before we get to the content part, give everybody a little bit of a background of that you've told me before, but you know, not everybody knows of you. So that you're a teacher coach, or what, what you were teaching, the psychology side, give everybody a little bit of a background. How far do you want me to go back? <laughs> uh, how about what's uh, like the relevant to, relevance to this, this speaking on the, the sports psychology side? Uh, well, I was a teacher in uh, Northern New Jersey for 41 years. I hate to admit that. <laughs> And I coached baseball for uh, 38 years, 21 as a head coach. Uh, since I retired, I've been doing this sort of thing. And uh, I, while I was teaching, I, I started out teaching history, world history, world cultures, American history. I went up teaching psychology and uh, I had a supervisor who wanted some elective courses. So I said, what the heck? I got this idea for a sports psychology course that I wanted my baseball players to take. Not all of them took it. They said it was too much work, some of them. <laughs> and uh, I won't mention any names, but he moved to Florida recently. <laughs> and uh, so I, I started it and I uh, probably taught that about seven years. And I finally got it down to where I, I liked it. And then I retired and uh, that was the only course I took with me. I took all of that sports psychology stuff with me and I had nothing to do. And um, I, uh, I had originally written this material for my players back in the early 90s to help them with their hitting. Not that it succeeded because uh, it took a while. And uh, I said, what the heck? I said, why not? Let's fool around with this stuff and add this stuff for my uh for my sports psychology course and things that I read and things that, you know, I heard and you know, quotes from here and quotes from there. And so I, I started doing it. And um, this uh, young man from Ridgewood High School in Ridgewood, New Jersey, um, Brendan Shintani, he was a sophomore last year. Mm. He created this website on minddesignsports.org. And there was an article in the paper in the record of Northern New Jersey about him. And I saw it and his email was there. And I said, you know, what the heck? I'll email him, see what he says. Mm -hmm. so I told him who I was and what I did, my background, this, that, and the other thing. And I said, I got these articles. And uh, he said, great, send them in. So what I did is I wrote these as a series of like 10 rules. And I had to find one that could stand by itself so I could put it on, on his website. And I did. I think this is rule number five and rule number six. Mm -hmm. well, anyway, I had to do some, some editing and adding and subtracting and things like that. So Joe, Joe uh, go into the, the 10 rules. You don't have to go into them in depth to just talk about, just list them out. And then we'll go into depth with the, the five and six that you're talking about. So what are those 10 rules? On uh, well, the first one is know yourself. And um, I dipped into my psychology curriculum and I took all of the, uh, the personality theories. And I, of course, I applied them to, to hitting. Mm -hmm. Freud and Maslow and Skinner and all these people. Mm -hmm. And I just picked out concepts that I thought would somehow fit and somehow make sense. And uh, I mean, the people that read them thought they made sense. Mm -hmm. 
And um, the second one was know the pitcher. Mm-hmm. And the third one was know the situation. And I did kind of like a takeoff on Casey at the bat. Mm-hmm. I put the poem down and analyzed Casey's situation according to these personality theories. And uh, I think primarily it was like the, the social cognitive theory, which is, uh, you know, which fit. And, and I just expanded on that. And that was the third one. And then the fourth one was, uh, you're testing my memory. I haven't really checked them a lot. <laughs> and, uh, I think the fourth one was paralysis uh, through analysis. And then I did a whole thing on the, on the brain and how the brain works. And uh, um, it, you know, like different parts of the brain and how they work, con- you know, the conscious part of the brain, unconscious part of the brain. And um, the, uh, the fight, flight, or freeze response. Mm-hmm. And I, I did something about that. And uh, then the fifth one was you can't try to hit the baseball, which was the f- first article on the website. Mm-hmm. And the sixth one was the conscious brain versus the unconscious brain. And the seventh one you're really testing me. <laughs> and if you can't remember them, that's okay. Uh, I, no, no, no. I, I, I got to <laughs> see if I can do this. Um, but don't beat yourself. And it was about basically how your emotions, how you can, your emotions can get the best of you. And, and I'm still working on the part about fear. Mm. And I used to do the biology of fear in my sports psychology class, usually around Halloween time. I had a good time with that. Mm. <laughs> and uh, I used the Batman Begins movie and the Dark Knight Rises. Mm-hmm. And there's things in there about fear. Liam Neeson is, mm-hmm. is great explaining fear to uh, Christian Bale. Mm-hmm. And number eight, uh, number eight. I'm trying to think what number eight was, Joey. You're doing uh, good, Joe. Number eight was um, you got to deal with the ups and downs. And number nine... Not sure what number nine was. I could check on my phone real quick. But <laughs> number ten. Number ten was about n- not living in the past, living in the moment. Mm. And I did a big thing on rock climbers. Mm. Um, and then Alex Honnold climbed El Capitan without any ropes or harnesses. Or- yeah, saw that. And it, it was a National Geographic thing. When I saw that, I said, "Wow, this is like absolutely the most amazing thing I've ever seen." Mm-hmm. And um, is that that free solo? So uh, yeah, solo? yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Netflix. And, and it was uh, there were some other things. And um, I'm trying to think what number nine was, but you know that that sort of stuff. I mean, I haven't gotten to put any of that stuff yet on on that website. I don't know how many of those articles I'm going to put on. They're kind of they're kind of long. Yeah, no, that's that's good. And even if you did two parters, I saw especially the. Um, conscious versus unconscious brain that would be even better in a bite-sized digestible chunk like a two or three parter i mean even if you did that instead of putting it all in one would be good yeah i, I mean i probably should have i didn't realize how long it were till i thought <laughs> like i saw them on this website yeah and one of my former players a uh, former all-state second baseman who's now a lawyer in washington dc mm-hmm. i think he made a comment that it's a rather long article <laughs> how i think he wished that he wrote it but <laughs> that's the, that's a long story for another day perhaps yeah well well you, we you could probably pop number nine will pop into your head as we go into these but let's talk let's talk about the the number five which is you can't try to hit and go and start going into that a little bit what do you mean by you can't try to hit um, a strange thing about it is 1980, when George Brett was going for 400, he was going to be the first player to, uh, to bat 400 since Ted Williams. And I, I followed that at the time, a little bit, I realized, and, um, he, he, he on TV or right around the time where the end of the, I don't know. He made a statement, which I could not find anywhere, but I remember him saying these words exactly. He says, I didn't hit 400 because I tried to hit 400. Mm. I could find that anywhere. I found other quotes where he 
kind of suggested that he, he does an interview on YouTube. I found that and I found some, some articles on the New York times, maybe. And, you know, I went digging through Google to try to find this stuff. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I said, you know, I, I said, I, I, under, you know, I backed down. I said, I know what he's talking about. I mean, you just, you don't hit by trying to hit, mm-hmm. just don't hit a home run when you try to hit. And, and the strange thing about that, I put that in the, the article as an update. Christian Arroyo, who was an uh, infielder with the Red Sox, although he's had an up and down season with injuries and COVID and things like that, a very good hitter. He had a grand slam home run to win a game against the Atlanta Braves in Atlanta, Nia Fenway. And um, they interviewed him after the game. And I, I saw it on MLB Central in the morning. Hmm. And I said, there it is. And he basically said, you know, you don't hit home runs when you're trying to, you hit them when you're not trying to. Well, say, say what they, was that the stat cast one where they said, Hey, uh, 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 did you know that you hit this stat cast? I got this home run at 462 feet. Did you try and hit it 462 feet? Was yeah. That yeah. One? That was, that was the one was 467. And he 467. said, what? He was like, what? what? <laughs> did you and, try to uh, do that? <laughs> and he was, you know what? It's very funny with these players today. They, they must take a seminar on how to, you know, give interviews like Bill Belichick. <laughs> they don't, you know, Aaron Judge. I mean, mm-hmm. they must be like, you must uh, watch film of Derek Jeter or something because they really don't say anything. Yeah. And Royal was amazingly honest mm-hmm. and he, he just didn't conceal any of his feelings or, you know, what he thought. And he just let it all out there. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, so I, I added that to that article. It's mm-hmm. in a, it, it's under update, and uh, I found that very interesting because you don't really hear somebody saying that. And you had a couple examples too of that scene in Star Wars with Yoda and the back, Legend of Bagger Vance too. Talk about those. Uh, well, Star. I'm not a Star Wars fan. Matter of fact, this is probably the only Star Wars I really paid attention to. <laughs> and uh, my sons and my wife are into the Star Wars stuff. Mm-hmm. But Yoda's telling Luke Skywalker, I, mean, I guess he had to fly a, you know, fly one of those jets or one of those things. The through fighters. Some narrow, yeah, through some narrow passage and, and you know, the whole, uh, you know, the whole society depended on him. And he says, well, I'll try. And then Yoda said to him, you know, try not, do or do not. There is no try. Mm-hmm. And I'm saying I said, somebody like read my mind here. <laughs> I mean, it, it's a, it was amazing the people who were like into this same like notion. Robert Redford, mm-hmm. I mean, he did it in the natural. You know, he did, you know, there were scenes in the natural where, you know, when he was trying, he, he just failed miserably. And uh, when his mind was taken off what he was doing, he succeeded. He hit the ball and knocked the light tower down. And, mm-hmm. But in the, the movie Legend of Bagger Vance, in the beginning, there's a young man named Hardy Greaves. I forget who the actor was. He's hanging out with Will Smith, who was playing a caddy. Mm-hmm. And they were walking the course to see what it was all about and with the dew and all the stuff. And, and the kid was putting. And, um, and, and Will Smith said to him, you, uh, you can't make the ball go in that hole you got to let it. Mm. Well, the same thing applies to hitting. I mean, how many people go in there? I mean, I gave examples of George Brett when he was going for 400 and when he was trying to hit 400 and mm-hmm. Alex Rodriguez, when he was going for number, his number uh, 500th home run, I think it was 2007. Mm-hmm. He was like in a slump for, you know, weeks before that mm-hmm. between his 499th and his 500th. And he said, I, I you know, something to this effect that I admit that you can't hit a home run by trying or you can't by the force of your own will. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, so like I I hear these quotes, like I hear these quotes on TV and I said, geez, that's, you know, I write them down and I go looking for them and I found them. And um, there's a very interesting article, which I used in my sports psychology class. And uh, it was written by a journalist named Lawrence Shaneberg from 1989 and i saved it hard copy 
Hmm. And I still have it. And uh, I included the link. I don't know if everybody can get it from that article because you've got to pay money to New York Times. But I mean, I could get it. Hmm. Well, anyway, Lauren Schoenberg, Schoenberg basically said the same thing. And he, he had a, a kind of cute little phrase where he said, um, the more you forget, the better you are at doing it. And the better you are at doing it, the more you can forget it. Mm. And he, you know, he talked about the so-called paradox of thinking that you can, you know, just do this by the force of your own will. And you can't. And uh, he I quoted uh, Tim McCarver. Mm. And Tim McCarver said, the mind is a great thing unless you have to use it. <laughs> and I like all this stuff, like, it just, you know, it, all these things like stuck. And I say, God, you know, this all like fits into a nice little unit plan for my sports psychology class. Yeah. And, and that's basically what I did. And, um, you know, the more I dug into it, the more I found, the, you know, more interesting quotes and, uh, you know, it goes all the way back to college. There was a book out. You may have heard of this book. It was called Psycho Cybernetics mm -hmm. by uh, Dr. Maxwell Maltz. I think he yep. was a plastic surgeon. Mm -hmm. And I got into it because my cousin bought it and told me to read it. Of course, I didn't read it when he told me to read it. <laughs> like I should have. But there was a pitcher for the Montreal Expos named Carl Morton. And he was reading the book. <laughs> and I guess he got into the book and he got obsessed with it. And he drove Gene Mock, who was like the old school of old school managers. And then Joe Torrey got into it too, I think. Mm. Uh, Joe's listening out there. He can confirm. <laughs> but I remember the two of those guys were reading this book. Gene Mock, I mean, Joe Torrey, well, I don't know who he was on the Cardinals at the time or the Braves. I don't know. He could have been, I don't know where he was. Um, but Carl Morton drove Gene Mock nuts with his book because he was walking <laughs> around with it all the time. You know? <laughs> And, you know, it reminded me, uh, reminded me of my college coach. Um, I was, I majored in history, but I was always reading psychology. And we went down south and I, some bookstore somewhere in one of the small schools we played. And I bought a book on existentialism. So I guess the word got out that, you know, Yurko bought this book on existential. It wasn't some kind of nerd. I didn't think they used the word nerd back then. <laughs> so we were practicing in the rain one day after a losing streak where we were just horrible in practice. I mean, a combination of the two. So our coaches had us run from foul line to foul line, you know, carrying a ball. We'd throw a coach a ball in the center field, then we'd run to the left field line and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth in the rain. Mm -hmm. And back and forth, we're doing this for, I don't know, an hour. And my head coach yells to me, he says, hey, Yurko, what is your psychology? What do, what do your psychology books say about this? <laughs> and I said, nothing, coach, nothing at all. I was afraid <laughs> that if I gave him some like, lecture on behaviorism and punishment and all this other stuff we'd be out there till like midnight <laughs> and um so you know it uh, that book got me started and i wrote a term paper on it for psychology class my sophomore year in college and i related the game of handball we used to play a lot mm -hmm. I, our college coach got us into playing four wall handball which was the greatest game for baseball that other than playing baseball i agree the ball like moves all over the place and you got to react you got to use your left hand and your left hand you're like you know totally like uncoordinated mm -hmm. and you got to learn to use it but i got pretty good at it mm -hmm. but i it drove me nuts that whenever i tried to make a kill shot off the bottom of the bottom of the front wall from like a ball that bounces off the back wall i always either skip it or hit it too high or mm -hmm. like, i would miss and then i'd be running around like a crazy person chasing balls around and i just let one fly and boom right off the bottom of the wall and that would drive me absolutely crazy mm -hmm. i said how does this happen i mean how do i you know i try to do it i can't do it if i don't try to do it <laughs> there it is and it would drive me nuts i mean i i'm running around running around running around just like 
hitting the ball like you know out of desperation and there's my kill shot right and, um so i wrote a paper on it for a psychology class got an a on it yeah and, uh, i don't know where it is though i lost it somewhere and what's interesting is you you uh, shared a story with me when you were coaching. You you were going to go out to the mound. There was a remember the situation to tell that story a little bit, and because some people are wondering out there, well, how do we, if they're a parent or an instructor or even a, a team coach, how do we apply this to somebody to coach them not to try? Right. So I think that story will help. Uh, so that one where you went out to the mound or you decided not to go out to the mound for a certain reason. I'm going to be honest with you. I don't have an answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, how did you do it? How did you get out of your head and just react when you play? Yeah. So that's, yeah. Um, I still want you to tell that story though. Cause that's a good one for, for team coaches, especially, but um, yeah. So I, you know, reading your stuff and, and got me thinking most of the times when I got super frustrated, it got to a point where it was a boiling point and you can see it for those out there that work with kids when they get really, frustrated with something you're trying to get them to do when you start seeing the tears come to their eyes. And it's not because you're, hopefully you're not degrading them or anything like that. They're not getting, they're not tears of, they feel like, you know, hatred, they're getting bad negative energy from you, but it's that they can't, they have, they feel like they can't do it. And it, it was during those times in my playing time that the boiling, the water, the pot started boiling over. And I finally just said, you know what, I'm done. Like I'm done thinking about it. I'm done. Um, putting a ton of energy on it and it would be like i would let it rest for a day and then the next day you'd start to get these ideas bubble to the top of your head and then i would start working on those ideas but it's until like you said until you let go and you don't try is when those ideas start coming to you right um and that's and that's what i did it was just trial and error i'll tell you that's you know well you know not to jump around here but what you just said um my senior year in college, my coach bench, benched all of the senior. I mean, he just lost it with us. So he puts me in the pinch hit in a critical situation. And, of course, I was not too happy riding the pines. He puts me in the pinch hit in a critical situation. Then on first and second, I think two outs, something crazy like that. You know, I said, all of a sudden, I'm sitting around for two hours and you expect me to do miracles here. <laughs> I go up there, and I think the first swing, I'm trying to, like, hit the ball over the moon. And then a couple of pitches and then another one. And then finally I fouled off. I hit a fly ball to deep left field foul, but I squared it up. And I said to myself, there it is. Mm -hmm. That was just like an accident, but there it was. And then and I stepped out of the box and I remember saying that this is true. I remember saying to myself, screw it. I said, screw mm -hmm. this. I said, it doesn't matter. Next pitch I hit out of the park. Mm. And the coach, and I think the coach from the other team yelled to his pitcher, keep it in the ballpark. And whether subconsciously that gave me confidence mm. was after I hit that long foul ball or something, but I hit a three run home run. Mm. And then he adjusts the lineup and puts me back in. Like I said, Jesus, you know, I just, just it would drive me nuts. Well, yeah. anyway, so we're playing in a County tournament game in uh, Bergen County, New Jersey, and we're winning. And um, all of a sudden, uh, you know, the closer you get to the, to the goal line, you kind of get a little like, you know, nervous or anxious or whatever. And I sense this with my team and then my first baseman <laughs> drops a routine throw mm. to first base. And I, I had a first year assistant coach at the time. And I'm thinking, do I go out there? If I go out there, I'm going to lose it with these guys. And um, I mean, how do you, you know, like, how do you get nervous at this point? <laughs> you know, but they were, or at least I sensed they were. I said, mm -hmm. so what do I do? So I said to my assistant coach, first year with me, you go out there. So he calls timeout, walks to the mound. And everybody, the infields are all in there, pitches there. And they're like, what the hell is he doing out here? <laughs> like, he never went out there, you know, like it was his first year. Hmm. He never went out to the mound to talk to the team. <laughs> and he walks out there and they're all like, like, what's he doing here? Like they're talking to him. So like, what the hell is he doing here? Hmm. You know, like they're going back to their positions. Like, what the hell is he doing? Out here? Like they're still thinking about him coming to the mound. Mm -hmm. They forgot that they were screwing up and getting mm -hmm. anxious and nervous. And we win the game. Yeah. Yeah, and, pattern, pattern interrupt is what we call it. Yeah, well, you know, in the movie uh, 
the legend of Bagger Vance. Will Smith did that with Matt Damon. Mm. First round, they're walking the course, and he senses Matt Damon is self-conscious. Everybody's watching him. He's a local hero. He's playing these two professional players who are famous. And uh, he starts talking about the color of uh, one of the guy's socks and, and the price of tobacco. Anything <laughs> but... <laughs> You know, why are you self-conscious? What are you nervous about? That mm-hmm. sort of stuff. That mm-hmm. never works. That really never works. Mm-hmm. You know, how can you be nervous in a moment like that? You know, like you can't, he, he didn't call attention to it. He diverted Matt Damon's attention from, you know, his self-consciousness and it worked. Yeah. And it, uh, sure. I mean, I've seen it. I mean, I've seen that happen numerous times. And uh, I had a third baseman once. We were playing Catholic school powerhouse in the rain. And somebody hits a bullet down the line. One hop, line drive. He snares it, throws it first. He comes in. He says, I didn't even see that. <laughs> I said, I said, good, because if you did, you would have missed it. <laughs> and the thing was, is that he was just reacting. He mm. wasn't thinking. He had no time. Mm-hmm. And that's... You know, I, I don't have an answer for people out there, or a mm-hmm. guideline to follow. Mm-hmm. Um, it's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Uh, Ken Revisit did stuff mm-hmm. with Evan Mongoria. That's right. on YouTube. Tom Hansen. Mm-hmm. Tom Hansen, yeah, mm-hmm. Tom Hansen. Mm-hmm. And, um, and um, there's a thing on YouTube with uh, Revisit and... Uh, Longoria. Longoria, and he said he had... Ken Revis had Longoria stare at the, the flagpole. Oh, right. And earned the uh, the left field foul pole, not the mm-hmm. flagpole. Mm-hmm. And he would stare at the left field back, flagpole or like the, you know, hypnotize himself. Mm-hmm. And he said, that's what he would do. I mean, it, it, everybody's different. It, it's, it's, uh, or how many, uh, this has happened to me a few times. How many times uh, did the umpire call a bad pitch on you and you're like, go nuts with him Mm -hmm. you know to an extent or somebody you know you're in a slump you're hitting terribly and somebody like buzzes your head Mm -hmm. and the next pitch you like hit a bomb Mm -hmm. that happened to one of my players too we were playing a game he wasn't hitting well he was temperamental to say the least at times Mm -hmm. and this kid buzzes his head the next pitch he hit over the center field fence, which was like about 382, landed in the track. It had to be another 50, 75 feet mm-hmm. over that center field fence. And I said to the pitcher, I said, throw another one at his head. <laughs> and it completely got him out of you know, like whatever you know mindset he was in, which was negative, it got him into it. I mean, it just, I mean, I still I could still remember, I could still remember seeing it. I said, yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's that's interesting. And uh, when I remember my last year in high school, we were in a playoff game and it was pretty tight, pretty, pretty hot and heavy. And we had our, our pitcher at the time was struggling a little bit. He's doing really well. And then all of a sudden went in and he starts struggling about fourth, fifth inning or whatever. And we had our pitching coach come out almost like he would come out sometimes, but it was mostly our head coach. It's like what you were talking about with your first year coach assistant. Right. So our pitching coach comes out. He bends down right before getting to the mound and he picks up a rock and he starts staring at it and he's not saying anything. He's just staring at it. And I, and I, I was in center field and I'm watching this and, you know, uh, my pitching guy's got his hands on his hips, you know, and he just, our, our, our pitcher had his hands on his hip and he's just like watching this happen. And he's watching him. He's staring at it. He's staring at it. And then finally he looks up from the rock and he tells him, Hey, I just saw this out here. I, I just wanted to m- move it from being in your way. And then he w- turned around and walked away. Same kind of thing, right? Where yeah, he's cool. coming out, he's thinking, okay, oh, great. Yeah, I'm in trouble. What, what is he going to tell me? What kind of mechanical thing? He's probably thinking. And then the longer the, the silence happens, almost to the point of where the umpire has to come out and say, hey, guys, break it up. You know, you're not saying anything. You're not doing anything. And he waited until that moment to tell to finally say something. And it had nothing to do with what he was saying that we ended up winning that game, you know, not saying that that was the, the, the exact thing, but what you're talking about is like a pattern interruption where sure. if you have an enemy, that's, that's uh, what, what is, what did Napoleon say? If your enemy is destroying themselves, 
just let them destroy themselves. So don't if, they, interrupt them. if your enemy's making a mistake, don't interrupt, <laughs> don't, them. don't interrupt them. So it's like with the buzz in the head thing, it's like, that's probably the worst thing you could have done. Cause your enemy was, was in trouble, was, was making mistakes. So you just keep feeding it the, the same, the same, um, uh, stimuli, right. Feed them the same stimuli and let them end up hanging themselves versus giving them a pattern interrupt, breaking them out of that fog. And now they're, now they're fully focused on what they're doing. Sure. Sure. It, it's, it's really strange. It's like Tim McCarver said, the mind's a great thing unless you have to use it. <laughs> well, very cool, brother. Well, Joe, it was, it was great. I think we're going to have to do a, a part two as you start adding more of your 10. You got one more we didn't get to go over today, the conscious unconscious brain. So we'll have to do that on a, on a part two. But as you're putting these things together, I would love to, to have you on as we're, we're sure. going, you're working your way through it. Cause there's, there's a lot of depth here. And, and I, you know, I tell people, probably, you don't probably too much, <laughs> but you got a lot of, we got to, we got to talk about the kid, the, the uh, champion cup stacker. Yes. I, I was just the thinking neuros, about that. And the neuroscientist. Yeah. That's a good one. I think the conscious unconscious brain is going to be a good one, but that's going to be a whole nother show. I got <laughs> one before if I, so I don't forget, this is a great story. <laughs> we're in my sports psychology class. I had some of my baseball players and they were doing like a little group work, some kind of assignment. And I was sitting next to the guys that were my baseball players, like two or three of them sitting in a circle. And I was sitting right next to them. And I take out a, a pack of Orbit gum and I take out a couple pieces of gum and roll the wrapper up and into a ball. And one of my baseball players gives me this like dirty look. You know, I don't know whether he pointed to the guy. I don't know. Well, he gives me a dirty look. <laughs> and I said to him, I said, oh, yeah. I said, I'll take this wrapper and I'll stick it in your ear. <laughs> and he just like looked at me like, you know, like hey, we're just joking around. Yeah. So I threw the wrapper at him. It went right in his ear. <laughs> right in his ear. And everybody who was sitting there in his group were like stunned. Because <laughs> I called it. I said, I'll stick it right in your ear. And he looked at me. I mean, he looked at me and the look on his face was like, you got to be kidding me. <laughs> you know what I did for the rest of the period? I got that rat. I got that rolled up wrapper, you know, gum wrapper. And I, I kept trying to stick it in his ear again. I'd hit him in the head. I'd, I'd hit him in the nose. Anywhere. I didn't even, I don't think I even hit his ear. I mean, yeah. I tried like for 15 minutes, I kept throwing this thing in his head and I couldn't get it in his ear. It's like, you know, you're coming off a basketball court, you're playing basketball somewhere with somebody and there's a ball at like three quarter court and you just grab it and throw a hook shot from three quarter court and it goes nothing but net. Mm -hmm. You know, how many times have you done that? Right. And then you say, I say, geez, then you try to do it again. And then you're like in there for another hour throwing hook shots from three quarter court and you can't make one even like hit the rim. Right. And it's it's really strange thing. It's it's you know, it's a fascinating thing. I, I think, you know, I think there's lessons for for people to learn from from stuff like that. I mean, that's why I did this stuff. I said, you know what? Worst comes to worst. I said, it'll be there for my grandchildren to read, you know. Right. No. And, and I think that was a great story to to wrap the, the bow on this conversation with the whole idea of returning to try. You can't yep. try to hit. Right. No, nope, um, not at all. So, so Joe, I appreciate your time, brother. Um, is there anywhere? So uh, I'll, I'll put those links in, but because uh, I know you got the link, you got the website, and then you got the dot com forward slash, and then there's a bunch of words after that. It's going to be hard for people to <laughs> remember all those, but um, I'll put those links in. But anywhere people can find you on the social medias or or anything. I, I'm not on social media. <laughs> it's probably I'm a good thing. More. I don't ask me why. I probably learned from your experience. <laughs> I don't want to, uh, honestly, I, my wife's on Facebook, drives her completely nuts. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, all the political stuff. I know. I said, being on social, it's like having a, another child or a, a pet. Yeah, or worse. Or worse. A pet and I, I, yeah. I haven't done that. I was going to do it. My son, Stephen, who's a cartoonist in California, mm -hmm. said, I will only get myself in trouble. Yeah. <laughs> he said, you'll say something stupid. Yeah. <laughs> he, you know, he used words which weren't yeah. <laughs> repeatable here. Yeah. <laughs> but 
I said, well, well, and I, I'm still thinking about it, but I don't know. We'll see. It's, yeah. Let's see kind of response we get, you know, from, from all this stuff that we said today. Yeah. Let's see if people are interested in it. And if anything, uh, maybe a, a, a simple website would, would be good to be able to post that stuff on, or even eventually when well, you get all, all 10, you could put in a book. I have, uh, I'd like to do that. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's what I, uh, you know, when I started doing it, I said, well, this isn't half bad. Mm-hmm. And of course I wrote it. So, you know, I would, give it, <laughs> I would give it to people. I would give it to, you know, my former players. Mm-hmm. I said, let me know. I, how good is this? Is this well, you know, is it terrible? Is it good? And, you know, one of, and one former player who, who reads all my stuff and every book I told him to read, he's read. That's good. I've given him like a whole list of books to read mm-hmm. and he's read them all. That's cool. And, um, uh, he, so he's kind of into this stuff. He says, I wish I had this in high school. I said, yeah, me too. <laughs> me too. <laughs> I, was, I was my own worst enemy. And yeah. uh, I said, if I understood, I mean, it took me a while to understand this stuff. But I don't know. I guess that's in the offing. I guess I'll have to work on something. I guess, um, uh, you know, they could put comments down and I could get back to them. Yeah. Yeah. On YouTube or wherever. Or, or maybe can... an email. Do you have maybe an email they can reach out to you if you want yeah, to do that? Sure. Yeah, Which you have my email. email. Okay. Do you want to say it here for those that, that are just listening? Uh, yeah, sure. JKJY24 at gmail.com. There you go. Cool. And, well, Joe, uh, oh, oh, go ahead. And that, that's it. Listen, thank you very much. I appreciate this. Yeah, Joe. Yeah, I, I appreciate it too. And again, I, like I said, I think this is something that's good for some people out there to be thinking about, especially when it gets to the mental side of the game. So I appreciate your time here today, brother. Oh, I found number nine, by the way. Oh, what's number nine? Good hitting could lead to failure. <laughs> there you go. Awesome. I knew it was something like that. It's been well, a while th- since I wrote, I wrote that one. Well, well, well thanks, Joe. Um, and stick, you, Joe. Stick, stick around. I'm going to stop the recording, but uh, okay, st- sure. stick around real quick. All right.